All right, let's see how this is working now. And there we go. Okay. Now if this will stay, we'll be all good. Sorry. Been having some technical difficulties today. Okay. So, today I um, had asked last week, or a couple days ago actually, um, what anyone would want to hear me speak about. As it had been suggested that I talk about some... Uh, history subject as most people know history is my forte uh, just something I love and what I do so it was suggested to me over 30 times actually to speak about the US Constitution and what does that mean there's a lot of things about the Constitution so what are we going to discuss specifically um, I've written notes if you want the transcripts of today you can go ahead and talk, ask me for them after and I'll give them to you so Thank you for tuning in tonight, as promised. Um, we're going to go over the Constitution. It's going to include some background history on the Constitution, the Convention itself, influences on the Constitution and how it formed, as well as the continual arguments we're having today over the Constitution. I'm going to try and present the facts on based completely on 100% facts and non-biased, meaning I'm not going to talk about what I feel unless anybody specifically asks me for my opinion. Um, I'm going to try and keep it nonpartisan and keep my opinions to myself. But please ask questions. I'm monitoring this on three different ways. Um, so it's, it's really nice for me. Um, okay. So what's when's the last time you heard about the Constitution? Well, last time you heard about it is probably not that long ago. We're having so many problems these days. Um, so... Before we talk about today's problems, let's go back in time. I want you to think in your head. It's 1786. The young nation of the United States is kind of faltering, actually. As states are dividing over our politics and our power, um, it, it's kind of interesting, the whole situation we're seeing. Only a decade earlier, the newest nation in the world at the time actually declared themselves independent of the greatest country in the world, the great the United Kingdom of Great Britain, um, which included, obviously, as we know, pretty much a whole lot of the world. There's the reason there's the shot hurled around the world in Lexington and Concord. So this resolution that they submitted to become a new country, we know as our Declaration of Independence. Um, although it stated principles and why we should govern ourselves, it did not state how we should govern ourselves. It was kind of interesting. Um, the creation of government was postponed until later. Um, when the country would be actually out of war. Um, instead, they created something that we call the uh, Articles of Confederation. In 1781, the Articles of Confederation were ratified by all the states. Um, they would serve as what we would call our Constitution nowadays. Uh, document was approved, and at the time, it was very, very well recepted by anybody and everybody. All the states kind of liked it. it. It worked, but there were a lot of problems. The major flaw, they were weak. How do you have a government that's weak? The weaknesses of the Articles, um, they gave too much power to the states and not enough to their central government and themselves. And the central government wasn't able to pass laws or taxes if not all 13 states said, yeah, let's have a tax. So if only, you know, Virginia and New Jersey wanted to tax because it helped them and everybody, but let's say New Hampshire said no, well, then it wasn't approved. So it, it took a lot to get into. Um, once again... If you're just joining me, comment questions if you want. I'll answer them as I go along. Um, they couldn't declare war. They couldn't make peace. They couldn't have a standing army. State, state power was where it was at, which is really interesting considering how we'd come. But seeing that they were su under such an oppressive central government, it makes sense to a point. Okay, so the central government also was only created of Congress. They had Congress themselves, and they kind of did everything. No one else did anything. <laughs> How do I say this? In order to change or amend the articles like we would now have amendments on the Constitution, it was pretty much impossible. All states 
every single representative, not just like, you know, you have three representatives, two say yes, and one says no. All of them, all representatives, all states had to say yes. So in 1786, a convention was called to amend the, Const the Articles of Confederation. And it was held in Annapolis. And they kind of said, oh, we're going to put it off till 1787 in Philadelphia. We're going to meet where the declaration was signed. We're going to save ourselves an extra year. And we'll send everybody we need to. Well, 55 delegates from all 13 states were able to meet and discuss the issues concerning the national government and its powers. In the Pennsylvania State House, they decided to replace the Articles of Confederation immediately, and put it into a new system of government. They knew that they needed one. Uh, the most prominent voice for this, um, as we've often heard as the father of our Constitution, is James Madison. Um, he ends up becoming our fourth president of the United States, even. And one of his friends, and actors actually at many times, Alexander Hamilton, who became our first Secretary of the Treasury. So... The delegation soon agreed to choose a president to preside over the convention, and they didn't really know who. Well, it kind of came about that, why not General Washington? He was well-respected, well-liked, and he had a lot of power, and people would listen to him. So they said, sure, let's have General Washington. After that, the delegates uh, decided, all right, let's do this. The Constitution was formed. The Constitution was not perfect, however. They... All right, Dad Nordstrom, I'll get to that in one second. Uh, they knew when they would form it that there was going to be problems that needed to be able to get into. How do I say it? They needed to be able to form a government where everyone would be happy, yet be able to transform as we grew as a nation. Once again, a living document. So Dad Nordstrom says, why did they need, why did they know they needed a new binding agreement? There are very many theories on this. There's several different, um, I've heard several different answers through my time in study. Um, Chase, I'll get to yours towards the end. They, the biggest problem was that the country was falling over in itself. There were rebellions, Shays rebellions, one of the biggest, um, where they were actually killing their own, um, citizens for, they were fighting. I mean, people were unhappy with the government on both sides. People were unhappy that we were free. People were unhappy that they were actually going to tax us. They were going to try and do something to anything to us. Um, they needed a new binding agreement to try and pull the states together to actually unify us, uh, which actually a Masonic principle, which I'll get to on the influences in the Masonic section, that we needed to be one. Um, our very famous motto, our E Pluribus Unum, out of many comes one. Um, we are many different people. We have many different things, but we are one. Um, okay, so... Back to where I was. Thank you, Dad Nordstrom. That's a good question. Um, but making the Constitution themselves was a task. The Constitution, the Constitutional Convention had a, a lot of problems. One of the major ones was that no one could compromise. Oops. Technical difficulties. Sorry, guys. Um, there, there are a lot of technical difficulties. The biggest technical difficulty... Or, Sorry with my phone. Um, the biggest compromise that came out was what we know as the Great Compromise or the New Jersey and Virginia plans. Virginia wanted a government that consolidated among representation proportional to state population, which favored Virginia. Had a lot of people. It was a really big state. New Jersey wanted everyone to be equal because they're a smaller state. They want the same say. So Sherman's compromise, as it's now come to be known, called for a bicameral legislature, two houses. And it's to be separated as such that the lower house, as what we'd call the House of Representatives, is to be based on proportions to your population. Hence, California has 55 delegates total in Congress. Okay, 53 of them are because we have 53 congressional districts because there are so many people in California. If you take the state of Nevada, there's 2 million people in the state in the valley, 2.3, 2.4 at this time. Well, 2.3, 2.4 million compared to our Los Angeles, that's nothing. It's... It needs to be proportionate. But also they agreed that everyone needs to be equal. So they created the Senate, the upper house, which would have two senators and equal representation. So there will always be no more than two in each. Right now, as we see it, there will never be more than 100 senators. Uh, there were... The articles that came out of the Constitution were the legislative, 
executive, judicial um, branches were the three main. That's what created their government, which is what we have now. Our executive branch consisting of the presidency, his departments, and so forth. The um, legislative branch, which is our Congress. And the judicial branch, which is the Supreme Court and inferior courts. Uh, when they created Article 1, they knew that they'd have to put a little check and balance on it, which actually comes from an old term, from actually a Masonic term, from Baron de Montesquieu in France, who was a Mason, who came up with the idea of three separate yet equal branches of government. Well, three separate and equal branches of government was something that wasn't really known. Many countries had, well, the king was in charge. Okay. And yeah, there was parliament, but the king had a lot of power. And here the king would give up power, Congress would get some more, and so forth. So the biggest fear was at the thought of inadequate representation. And the delegates felt that they had rightfully fixed this problem with the strict wording within the document itself. While also providing a clause, which we know now as the elastic clause, that gives Congress the right to stretch the meaning of the Constitution. Um, which we'll get to today's elastic clause problems. Uh, Article 2 itself defines the powers given to the president. And the president's job, essentially... Is just to enforce the law. Congress writes the laws, he enforces them. How does he do this? Lots of ways, and today it's even more gray, and I'll get to that. Um, Article 3 established a judicial branch, which is headed by the Supreme Court and the inferior courts as established by Congress. There's only one court in our Constitution, that's the Supreme Court. The rest are established as Congress decides to establish them. The Supreme Court has the authority and power of judicial review now and to interpret the law. However, when it was originally written, this was not known. It was not until 1801 and 1803 when the case of Morvery v. Madison came before John Marshall, the Chief Justice, his Supreme Court. And he ruled in such a way that he didn't make political battles and what we know now as judicial review. Um, the fourth article outlines the relationship between states with one another and as well as their relationship with the federal government and how they kind of go through, and um, Article 5 described the process for amending the Constitution. Like I said, they wanted to keep it a living document, to go with us as we pr proceed through life. They knew that if they made something that was stable, we could only go with it so far. We couldn't do a lot. So they wanted to make it so we could keep going for the rest of our time. Um, Article 6 establishes the rights of treaties and laws throughout the United States itself. The seventh and final article require that nine out of 13 of the states must ratify the Constitution for it to actually come into effect, and also outlines the process for future states to join the Union they must ratify and so forth. Um, although the delegates had made this Constitution um, and uh, was signed on September 17, 1787 by 39 delegates. Out of those 39 delegates, 13 were either currently Masons and two ended up becoming Masons later on. Most prominent Masons we know, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, several others also became Grand Masters in their several states. Um, it would take two years actually, September 17, 1787 to September 19, 1789 for the required number of states to ratify it. Now we have, later on, Constitution Day, November, and so forth, um, where the Constitution in today's time is actually brought out. It's the only day you can actually see it nowadays just because of a lot of problems in the National Archives. And it's really nice. Um, it's very beautiful. You already get the chance to see the Constitution or Declaration. I've seen them. It's wonderful. Now that I'm off my tangent. Uh, the fight continues today. Now, I want you to think of something. This document was... People think that it was created by average Joe, everybody and anybody. When in fact, it was actually created by the well-educated. These men were property owners, people with degrees, lawyers, surveyors, generals, just lifelong politicians, members of Congress before, during the war. So it's just, it's a little different than what we would consider today. It's kind of like we see today in Congress. Congress today itself, and most of our government, is made up of lawyers. Think of those who are on the judicial branch. They have to be lawyers. Think of those who have been president. Most of them lawyers. Think of those who are in Congress. Seventy-something percent have been lawyers before they were there. So I think that goes to show something about lawyers. And, you know, me going to law school here soon. Who knows? Maybe I'll end up there. So, Chase, the states that did not vote for it, there were only two. Um, they ended up actually ratifying it in the end. But there were only two that did not originally. So it meant that nine. It meant ten out of the thirteen. Um, the... The one that abstained to it said that if others adopt it, we'll adopt it. And when others adopt it, they automatically adopted it. 
Um, I won't get into specifics with that because that creates a whole other topic of conversation. So the impact of masonry on the U.S. Constitutional Convention is my next topic um, with influences and how it kind of came about. Someone else comment? Sorry. I'm getting phone, laptop, iPod, all that stuff's kind of telling you what's going on. So the purpose of this part is just to tell you about what degree I believe through my research and to suggest that there actually was an influence from Freemasonry over the delegates and their work at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. So as we know, and we are told among the 39 signers of the fundamental law, 13 at some time, like I said, were associated with Masonry. Of that number, 11 at the time that they participated in the Convention for the Constitution were Masons. Go figure. Um, two others who we know now of William Patterson of New Jersey and James McHenry of Maryland became Masons about 1791 for um, Patterson and 1806 for McHenry, respectively, um, as far as my research can include. So... At this time, masonry wasn't what we know it today. A lot more cohesion among states. Masonry had only created the first, what we call the Mother Lodge, the Mother Grand Lodge, first Grand Lodge, in 1717 in England, in London. That was the first time that we saw the Grand Lodge be created. So states didn't have Grand Lodges, really. There were a few, but not many. Um, and now that we're in a new country, they made them. And obviously George Washington and Franklin, we've heard, have been Grand Masters of those states. Uh, so, the early lodges and provincial Grand Lodges were careless about keeping records. Even though gr the Mother Grand Lodge herself um, has no formal record book for more than six years after it first started. So, and the provincial Grand Lodge of Western Hemisphere, which was in Boston, um, it started July 30th, 1933. It has no formal or continuous re records written in a book. Until seven, sorry, seventeen thirty three, not nineteen. Um, until seventeen fifty. So there were some times that were missing, so to speak. But we know of the influences of the craft for a lot of reasons. At the time, they were the only organization in the world to actually elect and allow representation and let everyone be equal. Um, there were a lot of other, as we would call, secret organizations, orders, and so forth. But Masonry was the only one. Um, James Madison was a Mason. He was, how do I say, he was such a reporter, and the only reason we know what happened at the Constitution, who influenced it, is because he took notes. So, the record of the Virginia delegation would testify to the spirit of the independence that prevailed at the con convention. The delegation included George Washington as chairman, but also Edmund Randolph, John Blair, James Madison Jr., George Mason, George Wyeth and James McClung. Randolph had the honor of presenting the general... Sorry, this keeps falling. Virginia Resolves, and what we call, as I said earlier, the Virginia Plan, which ultimately became the foundation upon which our Constitution rests. So, what was our problem? Why did we have so many Masons there? So, did Masons kind of create it? Were the Masons the ones who wrote the Constitution, or was it other people? Well, the, the group that wrote the actual Constitution was a committee of five, and only one was a Mason, believe it or not. It's actually a harder concept to come up than several others. And let me pull up my notes here so I, could, I want to make sure I state this 100% correct according to all the information I could find. Sorry, guys. I got off work a little while ago, so I'm still a little tired. Okay. The Masonic Revolution that took place um, in England after the creation of Mother Grand Lodge in 1717, according to Newton himself, um, concerned the position of Masonry relative to government and its religions. New constitutions adopted in 1723 forbade Masonic meddling in politics by stating its resolve against all politics as what not never yet condoned to the welfare of the Lodge, nor ever will. So they wanted to keep politics out. But the Constitution and how we came about with American Freemasonry was different. They wanted to separate themselves from their English forebears. Um, they never looked with approval or the unification of the craft and 
to one major national Grand Lodge, which is why each state has their own Grand Lodge now. We're not like England. In England, the Mother Grand Lodge is in charge of all provincial Grand Lodges, and they're all under it. Um, same with France, the Grand Orient of France, and so forth. So, the way they influenced the convention was, they are the most prominent speakers. When you look at the records and trans transcripts, they're the most prominent speakers in all of the different debates that were happening. They're the ones who put forth the most notable, as we would call them, uh, plants, Virginia plants, New Jersey plants, so forth. It's something that's just, you would never know unless you were part of the organizations and the family when it, how would I say, okay, so it may be of interest to note that among the Masons who signed the Constitution, four of them have the privilege, like I said, to serve as Grand Masters in their jurisdictions. On the whole, however, excluding Franklin Washington, whose Masonic experience dated back from about 1731 and 1753 each, uh, Masons at the convention were very young in the craft. They were very into it. Um, six of the eleven who had taken the degrees prior to the convention had been Masons for less than ten years. Uh, one of the group was a 14-year Mason, one a 34, and one a 56. And the longevity of others is not really known. One of my forebears, Jonathan Dayton, a uh, Mason, signed the Constitution from New Jersey. We don't really know when he was a Mason. We just know he was. Um, after the convention, or during the convention, though, with the Masons, what kind of happened between all of them was kind of interesting. When they would speak to each other in the convention, they wouldn't argue. They would just debate the points and get their point across real easy and then yield. Something you don't see a lot in politics, even today. Uh, they kind of influenced the flow. With Washington presiding, it also presented an interesting cause for them to be able to just connect. Um, they respected the man. They knew him as a well-read Mason. It was just, it's an interesting concept. So that's it for the Masonic ones. Let me put my notes here. Our next uh, influence was the influence of John Locke. So, his impact is really interesting. In the second uh, treaty of government, Locke identified the basis of a legitimate government. What does this mean? It means we need it to be founded upon where everyone goes. According to Locke, a ruler gains the authority through the consent of the governed. Meaning, if you wanted me to be president, you have to elect me president. If you wanted me to be king, you have to tell me king. I can only rule through your authority. You're the ones who tell me to be king. So... That's where we got our representative democracy and our elections from. We believed in this social contract. And they also believed that the duty of government was to protect the natural rights of people, which Locke had believed to be life, liberty, and not pursuit of happiness, but our property. So it was kind of interesting. John Locke was someone who you could either admire or hate him. Democracy was not created in a life beat, heartbeat. It wasn't just... The U.S. writing constitution saying, hey, we did it. It had taken centuries before. And... Sorry, reading Dan Nordstrom's uh, comment here. Yes, Dan Nordstrom, I actually do believe that. Um, I don't believe that masonry wasn't 100% a direct cause and effect to our Constitution. I believe it was an influence that kind of, it brought the people together. Um, even we see it today, where you will, you can find, you can see just, if you're in the organization, that who's a Mason, who's not in government. You kind of see that when they're together. And we kind of, we give each other, I want to say, a little more respect than others. I think it was just an easy idea and common ground for them to relate on. Because like I said, Masonry wasn't, the same in the United States. We rejected the idea of a National Grand Lodge, and even at the time of the Provisional Grand Lodge, others came about. What we'd consider clandestine lodges today were rampant. Lodges were all over the world and all over our area. A lot of Masons in the beginning of the United States, believe it or not. Um, and they were all really good and famous men, a lot of them. Um, but I believe it was just an inspiration rather than just the direct cause. Which, I mean, that's... Either way, I guess you could call it a direct cause as an inspiration, but it's just, I don't think it was one. There were many causes, and I think it was just one of the many inspirations that came about with it. Thank you, Dad Nordstrom. I love your comments. Um, 
the idea of self-government at this time was completely alien. Democracy takes practice and wisdom from experience. So essentially, they said, hey, we're going to make this up and do what we want. And we're going to create this stuff. We're going to try and write this constitution, try and write something so everyone will listen to us. And we're going to hope they listen, because if not, we're really screwed. Essentially. Uh, so the philosophs started it, and it kind of created, continued with us. Um, the Petition of Right, the English Bill of Rights, that kind of came before us, and that obviously in 1600, 1628, and 88, respectively, it, our ideas came from it. So, without the influences, what else happened with the Constitution afterwards? It wasn't ratified for two years, as I mentioned. Why? The biggest problem was what we call the Battle of the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists today, um, throughout our history, is because the Federalists supported ratification. The Anti-Federalists didn't. One of the most prominent Federalists who supported ratification of, this, of our Constitution's brand new document is James Madison, father of the Constitution. And Alexander Hamilton. Go figure. One who was against it... Or, sorry, Madison was for it. Hamilton was against it originally with Thomas Jefferson. Hamilton wrote for the Federalist Papers with John Jay and Madison. He kind of said, yeah, I'm going for it. But it took some convincing. He wasn't 100% originally. Let's ratify it right now. Because he had some reservations personally about Madison. And they rectified those. And then they wrote the Federalist Papers, which were supposed to be three essays, turned into a whole plethora of numbers. The Federalist Papers, really good if you ever get a chance to read them. They're, they're really, really interesting. But um, Thomas Jefferson was one of the biggest proponents against, I repeat, against the Constitution and ratification. What took him to ratify is what we know as the Bill of Rights today. So with our Bill of Rights, it's a collective name for our first ten amendments to the Constitution. Um, if you ever want to know your Bill of Rights and what kind of you go for, because some people know them, but they don't know exactly what they say, which is important. Um, the Bill of Rights Institute.org, as it's called, wonderfully states them and also tells you them in layman's terms today. So the First Amendment was that, I, we call it to learn um, the RAPPS, the RAPS. The RAPS is the Religion so, Assembly, Press, and Petition and Speech. So the First Amendment protected your right for represent for uh, freedom of speech. You can say what you want as long as it's obviously within reason. It couldn't be, I'm going to kill you. That's a threat. Obviously within reason. I don't like my government. I don't like this. I don't like that. Can we change this? I, I can speak my mind. Um, freedom of the press. We can't censor. We can't limit. That's why if today we had did not have freedom of the press, we'd be like North Korea where everything was state controlled. Um, even though that's an argument politically now, that's a different subject we'll get on later. Um, you needed your exercise of your religion. People needed to be able to practice what they wanted. We came as a free... The United States was founded for freedom of religion. Think of the col colony of Massachusetts. Now, did it become freedom of religion later on? No, it became a theocracy and so forth. Let's get another story with the Puritans. Um, then we could assemble. Under the British, we could not assemble for free. The Sons of Liberty, they were outlaws. Well, now we can assemble for free, peacefully. Um, you're allowed to have protests, you're allowed to support candidates, you're allowed to do this, you're allowed to do that. We can assemble. Um, as well, we need to be able to petition our government, regardless of any grievances. So, Amendment 2, as many people would say, our, our right to bear arms, our right to have our guns, a big discussion today, especially with this political climate. The words literally in the Constitution are not that every person has the right to bear arms, believe it or not. That's how it's been interpreted. But the words itself say, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the, to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So, it, it's such a hot topic to know, I won't get onto it politically um, until I talk about later what's wrong, why our Constitution, what, what we need to know. Um, in the third, it, we couldn't quarter troops. The British forced us to house soldiers during the Revolutionary War. So even if you were a patriot, as they were called, the traitors, or an American, fighting the British, you were kind of stuck. They said, you're going to house this soldier, or these ten soldiers, you're housing them, feeding them, clothing them, everything. No choice. So we can't do that during peace or wartime, and without the consent of the owner. So if they ask me, hey, you want to house a soldier? And I'm like, sure, sure, that's fine. But I have to be able to consent. 
The Fourth Amendment is your right against unreasonable search and seizure without a writ of assistance, which is what we call um, supported by probable cause. It's a warrant. So you ever heard they can't search anything, show me a warrant, come back with a warrant. That's a warrant. Um, that's what gives you your protection. That actually became a hot button topic. And if you ever want to look something up, um, history or law, or just because you want to know your rights, look up the Cape of, case of MAP, M-A-P-P versus Ohio in 1961, U.S. Supreme Court case. goes over that very importantly. The Fifth Amendment, they tell you to plead the fifth. Everyone's heard that. The fifth amendment is that you cannot be held in a courtroom to perjure yourself, to give yourself, um, to incriminate yourself. So the way it's written is no person shall be held to answer for the capital or otherwise infamous crime unless they present an indictment of a grand jury, except cases arising in land or naval forces or militia, when in actual service in time of war. So courts of law and the military, court marshals essentially, uh, shall not be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor can you be deprived of life, your liberty, or your property without the due process of law. So you can't incriminate yourself, and then they can't take away your property and your things without you going through the court system. That's why they allow you bail. Now, bail will come to in a minute. You're also allowed a public and speedy trial. That's the Sixth Amendment. Um, if they can't delay the case forever and have you sitting in jail for five years while they're building a case. That's why, like, today, if, I, if you were arrested for murder, the district attorney has 48 hours to the clock, not 48, like, just two full days. 48 hours to file charges against you or they have to let you go. Doesn't mean they can't file later on, but they have to let you go before that. Um, you also have the writ of habeas corpus. So, bring the body here, as it's known. You bring the evidence before you. You have the right to cross-examine all that. You also have the right to have assistance for counsel. If you can't afford a lawyer, one must be appointed to you by the state. Miranda versus Ohio, um, Gideon versus Wainwright. All these landmark Supreme Court cases are interpretations of this Bill of Rights that protects us today. In suits of common law, which shall, in controversy, exceed twenty dollars at the time, the right by jury shall be preserved, and um, no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court other than the rules of common law. So even when you're suing someone civilly, you have the right to a jury trial. <laughs> Elastic issue fun time, Guns America. We'll get right there, Dad Nordstrom. Two more amendments, or three more, excuse me. The Eighth Amendment, like I said, excess bail shall not be required, but you're not, you don't have the right to have bail itself. You have the right to no excess bail. They can hold you without bail. That's not a right. A lot of people get that wrong, that you have to have the right to bail, the right to excess bail. Um, the enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights should not be constructed, deny, or disparage others retained by the people. Meaning, these are not all the rights. There are more rights into them. There, there are may, many more rights that we reserve as people, but these are the rights that we 100% cannot infringe upon as a federal government. And the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to states, are reserved to the states or the people, meaning even if they're not specifically stated to the states, the people have that power. So, all right, elastic clause issue for uh, Dad Nordstrom here. I'm pulling up my notes here. I use OneDrive, so. Um, elastic clause notes, that's what it's called. All right, so, what is the elastic clause? As I said, it's a term for the necessary and proper clause that's known in the Constitution. So, what does the Elastic Clause say? In layman's terms, you can do what you want. <laughs> um, it's an interesting concept, but it's Article 1, Section 8. It grants Congress the power to pass all laws necessary and proper for carrying out the enumerated list of powers. So... It pretty much is, it pretty much is a law, or uh, not a law, but a, a section in that Article Two, stating that Congress shall have the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into the ex execution of the foregoing powers, all the many powers listed to Congress, vested by this Constitution in the government or in the department or officer thereof, meaning if we specifically stated someone. So, it's it's. <sighs> This has been used many times. It's actually, we wouldn't be how we are today. The Louisiana, thank you, Madison. Um, the Louisiana Purchase was, Thomas Jefferson was known as a strict con constructualist. He could only do exactly 100% what the Constitution said. But he stretched what it 
what he could do by using necessary and proper cause by allowing Congress to purchase the Louisiana Territory. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, the Committee of Details that were called that were creating this, they looked at the resolutions, National Legislative Authority, and they said, okay, instead of listing 40 million different powers that we could have today and could potentially have in the future, we're just going to list these specific ones 100%, and there'll be a few others that they may need. Um, in 1819, John Marshall noted that other than grants of powers by themselves, according to the dictates of reason, would imply a means of execution. He says that the Constitution is left the has not left the right to Congress to employ the necessary means for the execution of powers conferred on government to general reasoning. Meaning necessary and proper clause makes an express power that otherwise would only have been implied and thus might have been subject to some problems. Uh, I, I've thought about being a teacher. I, not for me. Law is my passion. Um, the necessary and proper clause enacted as it means means really calculated to the effect any other objects entrusted to the government. So it's hard to state in his own words as it is back in the 1800s in layman's terms, but pretty much Congress can do what is right and allowed as long as the people support it. That's it's kind of the gist of it. Um, all right, so the gun problem. So... As I stated, the Second Amendment doesn't necessarily state that you have the right to bear your arms 100% on you. Um, it's a very interpreted clause. So let me pull that up. So the there's a there's a website called the Federal Arms and Liberty. Um, dot com. They talk about um, the federal cases regarding the Second Amendment. So, in 1876 was the first time we saw this problem. Um, it was the first case in the Supreme Court that gave the right to interpret the meaning of this amendment. The court recognized that the right of the people to keep and bear arms was a right which existed prior to the Constitution. And, how do I say it? It's just, oh, thank you, Dad Nordstrom. I'm getting notifications on three different computer monitors and my phone. Thanks. Uh -huh. It The way that they interpret it, it's not a right guaranteed by Constitution, neither is it in any manner dependent upon the instrument for its existence. They decided in this case, you can read the facts of the case to figure it out, but they decided that you have the right to keep a gun as long as the government doesn't say that gun's illegal. So how does this work? Well, today you're not allowed to have AR-15s. You're not allowed to have really, really crazy guns in your house. You can have sidearms, you can have rifles and so forth. There's certain age limits as well. Not You don't get it when you're 5, you get it when you're 18. You have to wait for a while, background check, clear, make sure you pass laws, and then later on, you know, so forth. It, it gets really interesting. Sorry, I talk with my hands for those of you messaging me saying stop. I, I, I just, I talk with my hands. It's not going to stop. <laughs> um... It's an issue that even today is a problem, um, and it's a political battle. I don't like getting in there because of my political feelings. Um, some of you know it. I'm a Democrat. However, I'm actually a moderate and very much in the middle. I don't want to offend anybody on either side of the aisle. It's just rude. But for guns, you have the right to keep them. You have the right to actually buy more, as long as you're doing it safely, is the way that it's been interpreted and taken to this day. Um, and do gun laws necessarily stop gun violence? No, everyone can see that. Does it help deter it? Eh, we're here to, we're here to find out. Remember, guns is something that we're, we're going to keep for the rest of our lives. Uh, it's just, it's a problem that we'll have until the end of time, really, as we continue with our advancement in technology. So, oh, you're welcome, Audrey. I understand. Trust me, I hate getting into political fights. There's only one person, he's not watching, but he knows who he is, um that I really like getting in political battles with, and that's because we can give each other each other's side, get mad at each other, but we love it. Uh -huh. So, the problem we're having with our Constitution now, the biggest one I see personally, as I said, I'm going to keep my personal feelings out, but from, in preparing for this, I had to pick my what I ranked, is the fact of the Senate and the confirmation of Obama's choice for um, Supreme Court. So... Obama's Supreme Court appointment for, 
How do I do this? And not offend. Give me one second. It's, it's an interesting concept. In March of 2016, he um, nominated Judge uh, Merrick Garland to succeed Justice Anton Scalia um, on the Supreme Court. But the problem with this is that the Republican-controlled Senate, and like I said, I'm not going to get into my own personal political beliefs, just the facts, do not want to confirm someone who they believe is more liberal than what they want. The Supreme Court, if you notice, votes a lot of times along conservative and liberal lines, left and right, left and right, excuse me, and they vote based on those lines. So it's, it's very hard to choose sometimes. Um, with... How do I say this? It's always hard when you nominate someone, even someone well-qualified, and they agree he's qualified, they, is it someone they want? The Senate is calling for an election. Well, the Senate knows that they can't have the people elect a justice. In the uh, Constitution, it specifically gives that power to the President to nominate members of the Supreme Court. He can nominate whoever he wants. They do not have to have any certain qualification. do not even have to be a lawyer. John Marshall did not have a law degree. He had a degree in history, became a lawyer by choice, as in back then you didn't have, and passed the state bar, became a member, and finally said yes. He was picked several times to be the chief justice, said no, finally said yes. Um, so, essentially. And he was confirmed. Um, that's why you have recess appointments and problems. Uh, but anyway, with the, with the United States, with the Constitution nowadays. That yes, Aubrey, I'll get to that. You have to be approved by the Senate by two thirds confirmation. This was originally set as one of the checks and balances. What, like I said in the beginning, Montesquieu had come up with three separate branches of government. Yes, it has to be approved. However, the stalling of a confirmation hearing in the Constitution it doesn't specifically state it, but it's been interpreted many times, even by John Roberts himself, the current Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, to be how we would call in California AR15s are illegal so um each state kind of controls that now it's it is the rate of fire that's controlled but in California AR15s are illegal now um my new job I sell guns and we get that question a lot now um one of my many facets anyway sorry about that thank you Dan Nordstrom with the nomination being put off it's as seen as a um, direct violation of the constitution in itself with the Constitution itself being violated, then those senators are no longer doing their job as, defar as defined. Um, yeah, Aubrey, like I said, California, they're illegal. That's where I am. So each state has their own rights, but most of them, it's just the rate of fire, autos and so, so forth. How many in the clip? Oh, there's Come to California. We're very interesting with our gun laws. You sneeze and there's paperwork. If you sneeze around guns, there's paperwork. Trust me. Uh -huh. Like I said, I don't want to get into that debate too much, just the facts of it, um, rather than the political debate. If you want me to do something on that, please let me know. Um, I'm also, I've already got some suggestions for my next video, you guys can tell me. Um, I've also been told to make a YouTube channel to be like John Green on Crash Course, but I said, okay, maybe, if I have the time. Um, where was I? Oh, with the pushing off of the confirmation, then those senators are no longer doing their job, then how can we consider the next senate's going to do their job? It's just an interesting battle. We've had several four to four cases settled. There's nine posts on the Supreme Court. Well, there's eight people as Scalia has passed. No one's filling his chair. We've had votes of four to four, even. So cases aren't getting resolved. There's no landmark decisions that are happening. And yeah, Olivia, I know. Trust me. Um, I sell guns daily now <laughs> and ammo. Um, anyway, it, it just gets kind of confusing when... Senators want to change the Constitution, but they know they can't, and it's going to be crazy, and the people want to change it, and the people want to do this. Okay, the Constitution, like I said, is not perfect. They knew it wouldn't be. It's a living document. Does anyone remember when women were first allowed to vote? Women didn't have the right to vote originally. Um, it was very interesting. Um, it wasn't until June 4th, 1919, that Congress passed a law that they... Because it can be either by convention, by congressional law, and states have to agree to it, and so forth. It's a huge process to amend the Constitution. Um, and it wasn't ratified until August 18th of 1920 that the 19th Amendment in 1920 allowed women the right to vote. It's the same with slavery. Slavery was legal in the United States until the passage of 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, which was we call the Civil War Amendments, you know, outlawed slavery, 
granted citizenship, consider them people, so forth. I mean, it just creates such a problem that even continues unto this day with race, uh, which we're seeing with the American flag with the protests, which I'll get to later. Um, it, the Constitution's ever living. You couldn't vote until you were 21, according to the Constitution. Well, people thought, why should I go and fight and die? Um, sorry, responding to someone. Exactly, Aubrey, Wyoming was the first state to allow women to vote. So, according to Amendment 26, the right to vote was 18, like I said. Um, your vote, you were t had to be 21 before that. But does anyone know when that actually came, that amendment? It, it divided the country a long, <laughs> for a very long time. And the last time it was, a, it actually came into um, being ratified was March 4th, 2014 by South Dakota. That was the last time the amendment was finally ratified by the states. Now, did it come into effect before that? Yeah, on October 4th, 1971, when Georgia said yes. Um, but having been ratified by three-fourths on July 1st, 1971 by both Oklahoma and North Carolina it came into effect, but think about that. South Dakota didn't even ratify it until 2014, so this is a problem we're fighting. The Constitution's ever living. 25th Amendment before that, I mean, giving the presidential succession line. It's just something that happens. It's going to keep going. We're going to amendment as we live. We're people. We progress. We are evolving. If anyone knows me, you know I'm a Star Trek nerd, so we evolve. That's our presence. In you is the potential to make yourself better than what you are. That's what it means to be human. We evolve. We move. We change our feelings. Um, any questions on that before I get into some of the other political battles of today because of the Constitution? Kind of outline the beginning and so forth. Anyone at all? Questions? Either text message, Facebook message, comment, whatever, real quick. Dad Nordstrom, I see you shared my video. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. As there are no questions... One of the big political battles today, um, let me pull up, I have my list here. Besides the Supreme Court, as I already mentioned, um, there's, how do I say this? It's an interesting case. We will fight over non-important things. For days, but the important things we'll fight over for, or we will fight over the non-important things for years, but the important things for days, and it's really interesting. Um, the important things we're gonna Congress redistricting. Okay, that's a big thing today to a lot of political people. How do I say this? It's gerrymandering, drawing the lines and stuff. The Constitution doesn't necessarily prohibit, and it necessarily doesn't let. It's just such a crazy situation that. It started out, it was supposed to be the most educated people were drawing the lines. The most educated people of the states were going to draw the lines, going to share this, going to fix that. And it turned out to be just political people. The Electoral College, which is insane in itself. When the Constitution was written, we aren't going to popularly vote the president. We're going to elect, elect him by an Electoral College where you need a certain amount and so forth. 275 today, and, or 270, um, to actually be able to win the presidency. Well, the way... The Electoral College was written was that you're educated, your lawyers, your leaders, regardless of political affiliation, were supposed to be your state electors who would cast the vote for president. Well, it started out that way. You're really smart people, which is people you want voting, right? You're educated. You don't want someone who doesn't even know the name of the candidates. Uh, that's why you have people who Mickey Mouse will win one electoral vote when they don't want anyone to win, which who knows? We might see in this political battle because... These candidates on both sides, there's people on both sides hating everybody. So we'll, we shall see. Um, I'm going in and voting for myself this year. So if you uh, don't agree with either of these two candidates, go in and vote for me. Maybe I'll win president and we'll have to re-elect because I'm not 35 yet, um, which is a requirement to be president. Uh, remember, this is just a general overview of the Constitution. If you want more detailed stuff, you can let me know. Um, but your electors were supposed to be really smart people and now they're chosen by the state legislatures and whoever's, um, good idea, Dad Nordstrom. That's a good idea. Um, why they, the electors today, if I, if I live in California, historically a blue state, a democratic state, most of our electors are democratic. They're going to vote democratic. You look at a 
map of the way California's voted, it's going to be that. Um, oh, that's a good idea, Dan Nordstrom. I will research some more. Very, very formidable. I definitely will. Mom Salvato, sorry, got a message from someone watching the video. Um, it's our electors today, you know, California's going to vote blue because that's who our electors are. That's who our state has chosen, who our state legislators have chosen. Um, when you go for a state like Texas, notably red, very Republican, they're going to vote Republican. Not all the time, but as we see a general overview, like I said, generally, it's going to be that way. It, it, it's just, it's very interesting. I don't get why. Hi, Cole. Um, yeah, I, it, it's a hard thing to go by. Like I said, there's just so many problems that we create. When in actuality, there's no problems that the Constitution doesn't address. If you look at it, the Necessary and Proper Clause addresses all the problems of the today. But are we going with those? No. There's there's so many problems with the Constitution. But you know what? We're the only country with a living Constitution that has been created and is written. England, our forebears, they have the Magna Carta, they have the English Bill of Rights. They have no written law. It's all common law. Like They have the statutes and stuff that they passed. But the written law that they're stuck. Yeah, it's very, very decisive right now. Yes, Dan Nordstrom, I agree. Um, England is some is a place where there's no written constitution. Parliament is made because Parliament became themselves. The drawing of lines. Yes, we're we're getting a lot of problems. Um, personally, I don't agree with the problems, but you know, we're only one thing. One, I'm only one person. There's only so many of us here. So, with the protests, I was asked to elaborate how the Constitution allows that is becoming big in the NFL is that um, is the sitting down in protest or kneeling during the national anthem well I had someone who awesome that's awesome house races is great uh, there's a group in Facebook I'm a part of that I'm called, um, it's called What's Happening to Lodi. I live in Woodbridge right next to Lodi, California. Um, and someone had posted in there, um, I'm trying to find it, last night. I remember the gist of it. It was a lot of people speaking. That at the Chavez and Toque volleyball game, varsity, the whole team kneeled at one point from the Chavez school. And people were just upset about that. Um... Other people obviously still upset and not upset over either supporting or protesting because of Colin Kaepernick. And that's an issue we need to address when it comes to the Constitution. When someone asks the question, does it allow it? It does. The Constitution doesn't talk about the National Anthem. It doesn't talk about a lot of things. The National Anthem wasn't signed in until 1954 under Eisenhower. Um, I'm not going to get on either side of the political debate here. But it is allowed and it it's... What we call, it's protected by our free speech. It's a form of speech, but it's speech that is done as a person. Um, it's as if I'm saying, I don't like this song, or I don't support what it supports. Now, to some, is it a stupid reason? Sure. To others, is it a great reason? Sure. Here's my pr proposal to everybody who supports and doesn't support. Why not propose a solution Instead of just awareness. Spreading awareness is wonderful. It's like raising money for cancer awareness. I'm pretty sure we're aware of cancer. And the causes, the effect. Why don't we spend the money and raise money for a solution? for To fix the problem. If we can do that and we can come together as a nation, we can do it. Have there been problems? Many. Like I said, the U.S. were ever growing. We're evolving. We can do this. We just have to do it together. Any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? Um, otherwise, my notes have exhausted, but the, so what document is it? That's in the flag code, actually, Aubrey, and the flag code is a code for the government, believe it or not. So when I pull up the flag code of the United States, it's the public law, it's under, it's chapter, it is chapter one of title four of the United States code. Um, it's advisable for display and care of the national flag. Um, when you see it, I'm going to read it to you specifically. 
The conduct during playing under Section 171 of the United States Flag Code is during rendition of the National Anthem when the flag is displayed, all present except those in uniform should stand at, atten should stand at attention facing the flag with the right hand over the heart. Men not in uniform should remove their headdress with their right hand and hold it on their left shoulder, the hand being over the heart. Persons in uniform should render their military salute at first note of the anthem and retaining position to the last note. When the flag is not displayed, those present should face toward the music and act in the same manner they would if the flag were displayed. So it says it should. It does not say you have to. Um, the reason being that one should stand is respect for the flag for those who came for it. We stand because those who cannot is one of the famous taglines right now, especially on social media. The government cannot force you, because of our freedom of speech and our freedom in our democracy, to stand for the national anthem. They cannot force you. Unless an amendment was passed to the Constitution. <laughs> um, and it would be challenged in in the Supreme Court either way. It would become a hard problem. Um, it, it's the flag code that you should. Um, personally, if you guys want to hear my opinion, I say you should stand. However, I'm not going to force any of my opinions on anybody if you're not going to stand that's your right and I will support your rights because once again it's your right so what is public law under the United States I have to pull up my notes <laughs> alright Dan Nordstrom um, so sorry I had to pull up my notes from one of my law classes um, the public law, the definition of public law, is that th those laws which regulate the structure and administration of the government, the conduct of the government in its relations with the citizen, and the responsibility of government employees in relationships with foreign governments. Um, it's Public law is a definition meaning that it's what the government must do, should do, and how they need to relate with the people. It's not necessarily what the people do to you. Um, it, it's, it's just an interesting concept to me personally being... Uh, my AA is in legal studies, so and I'm working, you know, on my other stuff and going to law school here soon. It, it's just an interesting concept to me. Law is always fascinating. Um, Olivia, why do we think we should? Why do I think we, we should? I think we should. Um, personally, anyone who knows me, I'm a huge supporter of the military. Um, many family members in the military. My brother was a Marine. Grandparents. My grandfather was in the Navy. I mean, just... I was in ROTC, a lot of just different reasons, personally. And those who have died and fought for the flag, we should stand. As, long, as well as my Masonic and Demolay principles that the red on that glorious banner has died a Richard Hugh with the precious blood that our nation's youth has shed. Meaning that the flag is to be in our custody. We're to protect and defend it no matter what problems we have. Um, the flag is not oppressive. People using it, that it oppresses people. The flag is what brings us together and makes us one. The flag is what keeps us the United States. How do you know a United States citizen or a ship or a plane or something just by looking at it? We're so many people out of many one e pluribus unum. How do you know? To me, the flag is just sacred. However, to some other people, it's just a piece of cloth. And the way the government, the constitution, the public code, the flag codes, everything, public laws are written is because it is your own right. You don't have to. If some people see it as a piece of cloth, it's a piece of cloth and I'm going to let them see it that way. It's their right. I'm not going to push my beliefs on somebody else. Um, I know someone who he thinks the flag is oppressive and, his, and he has very logical and solid reasons. I won't go into that, but he has very logical and sound reasons and arguments. The man did his homework and research. So I'm not going to why am I going to say, no, that's wrong, that's wrong, when he's actually 100% correct? It's just a piece of cloth. It really is. Have you ever looked at a flag? I have like 10 flags at my house. It's a piece of cloth. It's symbolism to me is why I think we should stand. But that's my opinion. Thank you, Olivia. Um, any other questions or anything for tonight, guys? Ladies, gentlemen? Yes, I talked with my hands. Whoever just messaged me that. Oh, okay, thanks. Anything else? Questions, comments, concerns, ideas for next time, ideas for next video. Um, I might make a YouTube channel. I think that's what I'm going to go do after this. Ah. My favorite color, just overall, blue. I, I really like blue. I don't know why. Just do.
yes, I'm wearing a purple shirt. I have many a color of purple shirts and different shirts. Um, just for, I was at work, so I'm required to wear nice shirts and so forth. And yeah, It's just a nice purple when you look at it under the light. Alright, um, as there's no other questions, comments, or concerns, I wish you all a good night. Um, it's about 8 o'clock here, so oh, about an hour of speaking to you guys. You heard me ramble and speak on, but um, thank you for tuning in. If You guys can share this. You can show people if you have any questions, comments, concerns. Um, I'll do another video here. Um, let's see, today's Thursday. Let me check my work schedule here. I'm going to try and do it on YouTube. If I can't share this exact one, I'll re-record myself and put one up. Um, I'll try and do one sometime within the next three or four days. Um, it's it, it's going to be hard, but I'm going to try. Um, Lodi de Malay has the great festival going on, and that's our biggest fundraiser. And I work a lot this weekend, so I will be helping them tomorrow all day, morning to night, about 12 hours. So, all right, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attentiveness. I know some of it was probably annoying, but it, it's just what I agree to and what I've researched for you. Any ideas for next time? Shoot an email, Facebook, phone, something. I got it. Have a good night.